Hello, uh, thank you all for joining us. I'm, I'm Rick Harnish with the High Speed Rail Alliance. I'm the executive director. I wanna thank you all for coming. Um, and uh, we've got Chris Ott on with us to manage the uh, question and answer in chats. So he'll be, uh, uh, if there's something super urgent, he can interrupt me or uh, he'll, he'll answer your, uh, ask me your questions um, after the presentation is over. Um, so uh, it would be best if we can use the, the question and answer section for questions, but feel free to chat amongst yourselves with the chat function as well. And Chris will watch both of those. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that piece. Um, a couple of core points before, I uh, wanna make sure we get covered before uh, we get uh, sucked into this too much. Uh, first of all, we've got the cart a little bit before the horse. So Peter Schwartz with the Federal Railroad Administration who managed the uh, process of putting together the plan um, has agreed to do a more in-depth presentation from the FRA's perspective. Um, so we're, I'm going to talk more about the implementation, implications of what we need to do as advocates, less about the details of, of the work that they did uh, so that uh, Peter can, I don't want to steal his thunder, we're really looking forward to having him on a, a future webinar talk specifically about the plan itself. Um, the, the second point we need to make is this is a huge step forward in terms of the states being engaged in thinking about uh, big goals for a rail network for the region. So this is a very exciting step forward. And the next step though is from our perspective, we need to build a coalition of engaged citizens and municipal level leaders across the region to have the states actually do the design work behind making this network work right um, and getting it implemented. So those are the conclusions. Um, and uh, we'll talk a little bit more. So there'll be three sections. One kind of talking about my views on how we think about this. Um, the, the second section will be a quick overview of the study. Again, uh, not wanting to steal Peter Schwartz's thunder. Um, and then the third is thinking about some specific implications for Chicago um, and what needs to happen there. So um, I will get the process started now. So uh, first of all, the why we care about this was kind of summed up pretty well in uh, an article in The Economist yesterday. Um, and it was actually an article about China and how China is risking its economic health uh, by uh, really clamping down on travel from other parts of the world. Um, and they started that with a discussion about how important travel is to being innovative. Um, and not just for business, but it's very important for keeping families together, um, especially as in the Midwest and the rest of the country, we are spread out um, with our families being spread out and our colleges being spread out. And making travel easier is important to maintaining those connections. And high-speed trains have the advantage over other modes of you can actually talk to each other face-to-face, -face, um, as is demonstrated here on a train going 186 miles across the plain um, coming into Madrid uh, back uh, several years ago to celebrate 25 years of high-speed rail in Spain. Um, and you know, we've, one of the challenges that we have, will, which will become more apparent as we talk about this plan, is that in Spain, Madrid's in the center. So it was easy to think about a Spanish high-speed rail network. In Paris or in Spain, in France, Paris is in the center. Uh, uh, Germany has a network of cities that it connected with high-speed rail. Um, and now, it, today, 
the European Union is working to connect those networks together. But there was a real clear place to start because those centers were in the centers of countries. We've got the challenge in this country of we don't have many centers like that in states. Um, most of our networks are going to have to go across regions, but we can talk about that later. Again, a little bit to uh, explain my philosophy of how this is going to work is high speed rail is part of a broader system. It's not really, and it doesn't, sometimes it is, but it, it doesn't have to be something that's totally separate. So we can think about it as a series of building blocks where in order to get higher performance, you have to take broader steps. So probably if you want frequent service at faster than 90 miles an hour, you need to separate passengers and freight. It's a good idea for frequent passenger service in any case. Um, the next is if you wanna go faster than 110, you have to eliminate the, the crossings with the roads so that people won't drive in front of the trains or walk in front of the trains. That's a good idea no matter what, but um, by regulation, you have to do it to go faster than 110. To go faster than 125, you need so much energy to move that train that you really need to have the electricity generated off of the train. Uh, today's passenger trains in the Midwest, they generate electricity to run the trains on board. There's talk about batteries and that will work in some slow cases, but it won't work in high-speed rail because you just couldn't have enough batteries on the train to power the train. Um, and then the next step is you probably are going to have to find new rights of way to go faster than 150 or 160 um, for a lot of reasons, mostly because the railroads typically go through a lot of small towns on their way. So there's lots of ways of piecing these things together. But um, we've, to simplify the discussion, we have separated this into three categories of track, shared use lines where the passenger trains are sharing with big heavy freight trains. That's probably going to be the most miles of the network in order to get a lot of geographic coverage. Uh, regional lines where um, the state or other government entity takes control of the line and repurposes it for frequent fast trains. The Northeast Corridor is one example of a regional line in this country uh, with the Acela. And then high-speed lines where you're probably building from scratch um, in order to go 200 miles an hour plus. Um, and uh, we've got one of these under construction in the Central Valley in California as part of the um, San Francisco to LA service and one proposed for uh, Las Vegas to um, LA that's well underway in terms of planning and then Texas Central and then the state of Washington has started seriously planning one that would link Portland, Seattle and Vancouver. So, but again, these can work together in many different ways in order to create networks where people can use the system in different ways. And the important thing is maybe you mix regional service getting into the urban or regional lines with high speed lines um, in order to get into big cities on a regional line. Um, but then out in the country is where you're really going fast. And then these pieces, again, and you add buses to it, they can create really complex networks where people can get across entire regions. But you have to have a big picture plan in order to understand which of these pieces works together properly in the right places. And that's what the Federal Railroad Administration has started doing in a couple of levels that I'll talk about in a couple of minutes. But again, going back to our philosophy, we think that in order to make this work um, in this country, we're really going to have to think about how this also makes freight service work a lot better, both in terms of working with on shared use lines on improving passenger freight service there, but also in encouraging the railroads to think about different models for handling freight so that they can take a lot of the freight off the roads that's currently going by road that could be um, moving by train if the freight trains looked a lot more like passenger trains like the Triple Crown train does that 
uh, currently runs between uh, uh, Det uh, Detroit and Kansas City. So uh, getting now into the specific plan that the FRA has put together. Um, I think I skipped one. Um, this is a building block towards creating a national plan. So they started with looking at a concept plan for the Southwest that was released, uh, I'm sorry, I forgot, about five to 10 years ago. Uh, that was primarily for those three states of California, Nevada, and Arizona. Um, but also included Colorado, New Mexico, and Utah. Um, they wrapped up a, a Southeast plan um, and that wrapped up in the last year or so. Uh, there's also a plan specifically for the Northeast corridor um, and then the Midwest plan. And it's interesting in this, the Midwest plan connects with the Southeast plan at Nashville. And I would really like to see one of the next steps being thinking about um, Chicago, Atlanta, at least, as a single route, as part of that connection with people getting on and off and not all trains make the entire distance. And then thinking about Atlanta down to Miami. And now you're starting to think in terms of a real national network. And I'd also like to see that happen uh, from Chicago to New York. Um, and right now there's a missing piece there, uh, but linking the Northeast corridor to the Midwest. But this is an important step towards thinking about this as a national plan. Um, and it makes sense to do it in these chunks. So um, this I'm borrowing uh, the presentation on this to make sure that we're clear in, in lining up with what, what their purposes were. Um, so this is part of um, engaging in a long-term visioning process. Um, it's getting a conceptual level of planning for a high-speed, high-performance network at the regional level. Um, and again, I talked about it supporting a national planning um, effort. Um, I want to make sure it ties in well with the state and regional processes that are already underway. Um, and that it's a, it's a step towards future planning and streamlining that planning and implementation over time. Um, it need to be very clear, this does not identify specific routes or alignments. Um, it, they're, they're not proposing to identify specific station locations. Um, that does not talk about feasibility. This is really a high level market study this didn't do any planning on the ground to figure out what makes sense. So what really needs to happen now is the states need to start working together to aggressively start thinking about what infrastructure needs to happen in this context of this broader scheme. So I wanna talk a little bit about what's come before. Uh, the first regional effort was uh, the Midwest Regional Rail Initiative which was a um, informal working group of states on this map, working together to coordinate um, what a regional plan would look like. And really they got into some, some planning work specifically on these routes that are in color. One of their constraints was not dealing with that grade crossing issue. So they limited it to 110 miles an hour though they did look at places where you could get to running frequent passenger trains on routes that didn't have frequent freight trains. Um, that pro the, the level of service on the freight network has changed since then, uh, but we're, this was really good because when the last round of inner city passenger rail funding, big chunk of it was available back in 2009. The Midwest was able to compete very aggressively for pieces of that funding. And because of that, we've made substantial progress on uh, fixing the Chicago to St. Louis and Chicago to Detroit corridors. Um, and so this was a very valuable and important plan that has already paid off. Um, in 2009, the federal government asked independent 
um, um, entities to provide proposals on how they would build high-speed rail um, in various regions. One of them was the Midwest and SNCF, which is the National Railroad in France, uh, proposed a high-speed network for the Midwest that would have these routes. So they uh, released this um, in 2009. Um, and I will, uh, so we're starting to see a development of specific routes that there's consensus around how to make these happen. Um, they looked at coming out to Fort Wayne. There's a really great right of way for getting to Fort Wayne and then up to Toledo. Um, and then this configuration gives the advantage of, you've also got high-speed rail now linking uh, Detroit and Cleveland, and then in further iterations, Columbus and Pittsburgh and out to the east and down to Cincinnati. Uh, so that was one effort. We did a similar study in partnership with Siemens and, and AECOM um, that uh, in 2010, and the pink is where we would envision uh, new high-speed lines being built. Again, kind of in line. Uh, this points out that without really doing true, true uh, planning, there's some decisions that can't be made at the top level. Um, but again, you're getting into the same network of what the core needs to be. And then Amtrak has recently, as part of their efforts to gain funding through the infrastructure bill that just passed. And I wanna acknowledge that it was really Amtrak's effort that made that money possible. Um, and part of this visioning process that they went through was, was key to making that, that infrastructure money possible. Um, but in their proposal, they were thinking shorter term, what could happen as, as um, uh, five, five to 10 year projects to get the, the uh, serious upgrades underway. And uh, that is highlighted here in the lighter blue and kind of the yellowish color. But again, aligning very well with what has been talked about in the past. So we've got a growing consensus on where trains need to go the next level is to think about doing actual design work and getting the states to work together on creating a true implementation plan. Um, so this was the framework that the FRA put out in their document a couple of months ago um, to um, uh, kind of emphasize here this is not the final network. This is a discussion point for how we move forward. And everything on this network, whether it's in gray or purple or yellow or green or red is integral to making a Midwest system work. The challenge was, this is a really, really, really complex network. And so at this level of study, it wasn't possible to think about those things that are in gray, but they're incredibly important to the entire thing. So what needs to happen is the states need to start thinking about their specific pieces and how they fit into this framework in order to get this entire system put together. But um, to discuss a little bit about the different service levels, so I talked about infrastructure with shared use, regional, um, and high-speed line. That's the infrastructure. In this um, effort, what they're talking about is service levels. So um, to think a little about, about uh, the Chicago to St. Louis network uh, piece of this, just as an example, to illustrate what those different service levels would be. Um, today, Amtrak is running five trains a day at five and a half hours. Um, in this kind of structure of they're talking about, emerging would be eight trains a day at four and a half hours. Um, and that's fairly reasonable if you were um, 
to double track and do some things at each ends. Um, regional is four hours um, with 16 trains a day. So that is a much bigger step thought of what the service level should be than what even the Midwest Re Regional Rail Initiative was. This is a huge improvement upon that. And this gets to the point where you've got basically hourly service. So even you know doing a regular day trip for multi-purposes between Bloomington and Springfield makes sense because the trains at hourly, at any combination in between, it makes sense to take the train. Uh, so this is really exciting. And then Core Express in this level of service would be 24 trains a day. And Chicago to St. Louis, that would get you down to around two hours, two and a half hours. Um, so again, this is exciting that we have the states and uh, through the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission working with the federal government to think about a long-term vision that includes those levels of service. And um, we should really celebrate that. And I wanna point out that the uh, lead on doing this visioning was the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission, which is going to play a key role in putting this forward. So um, thank you to the vision of the states um, years ago to create that commission to, in order to provide the coordinating effort between the states. So this is a, a huge step forward, something that we should celebrate tremendously. Um, and now, as I said, with the infrastructure money, the fun work begins of really getting to the nitty gritty of how to implement this. Um, so another thing that they pointed out was kind of the core to making all of this work um, is what's in, in magenta here. Um, so in essence, this is where the focus should be at the beginning of the process, really figuring out Chicago to Milwaukee, Chicago to St. Louis, Chicago to Indianapolis, and Chicago to Detroit. Um, again, not that anything outside of this is not important. It's just this is the piece where you start and work out. And, you know, again, it's harder to do in this, this region than it is in Spain or France because you've got multiple states involved here. So we're one of the topics that they discussed in this document is what do you do about regional coordination? Um, the way we did it for the interstate highways was the federal government created a master plan and then funded, you know, the first interstate highway network was done right after World War I. The uh, federal government laid out the plan and then said, we'll pay for half of it. Uh, the second interstate highway network was, done, was um, uh, committed to in 1956. And in that case, the feds paid 90% and said, you design it to our standards and we'll give you 90% of the funds. Politically, we're not there yet for the whole country, but you know, we need to really think about how we do this on a region by region level. And this plan talks about that in a really thoughtful and, and really moves the board ball forward in, in how we conduct that regional planning. The other thing that it does is points out that you have to think about these things in networks, not city pairs. Um, and this is one of the exhibits from that. So if you thought about each of these corridors individually, it's really exciting. You know, we're talking about 189 markets served, city pair markets, um, and 12 million people riding it every year. That's pretty cool, right? But if you plan it and think about it with people making connections between all of these routes, then you've got more than a thousand city points served, and you're tremendously increasing the ridership. And if you could include all of the feeders that will happen between of this, the ridership in the, the city pairs go up even more, right? So all of those gray lines, the bus lines that will connect with this, et cetera. So really network planning is critical beyond just city to city network planning, the way we thought about it in the past. Um, the other thing is that speed is incredibly important. 
So, you know, we talk about frequently in the past, we've talked about four hours being auto competitive for Chicago to St. Louis, but that only works for downtown to downtown. Um, if you wanna think about the metro areas, you really need to get closer to two hours. Um, so, you know, with the regional system, um, and if you go back to this map real quick here, um, what they're talking about is these areas in green, um, um, they can flip between one or the other. So they're not really sure whether it's core express or regional levels of service. Um, so if you look at this diagram here, if those are mostly, are, are all core express level of service, then you've got this huge range of markets that's within three hours. So you're really tying the region together. Um, at the, if you flip all of those green ones to regional, then you've still got really competitive train service for lots of markets. Um, and then if you just take the existing, there's many fewer that are in that, that range. And then in terms of the entire addressable market of who you could serve, again, if that core network was all regional, you're potentially serving much more people than you are um, through all of those connections. So speed really is a critical component of making this service work. And also it's a critical component of linking the Midwest to the Northeast or to the Southeast, because if you're getting from Chicago to Nashville in just a few hours and Nashville to Atlanta in just a few hours, now you're definitely in drive time range for Chicago to Atlanta. So this really is a, a much bigger step towards thinking about being much more aggressive about rail service across the whole country. And again, another exciting step forward. Um, the other thing that it does is it starts us to think about infrastructure issues and decisions that need to be made. So uh, my hometown is Cleveland. Um, sometimes in the perspective of this, uh, of my camera, I've got a map in there about, uh, or a, a picture of uh, Cleveland Union Terminal. I got engaged in this issue is because as a kid, I was upset that you couldn't, that uh, Cleveland Union Terminal was deteriorating very rapidly. Every time I went into Cleveland, it was seemed to be a little bit worse. And so I wanted to figure out how to get electrified trains back into Cleveland Union Terminal because they did have electrified trains uh, from the 20s up until the 50s. So Cleveland Union Terminal is here. Uh, there was a dedicated passenger main coming into that from each direction. Um, but unfortunately, the US, uh, there's a federal court now on part of the infrastructure for that, that facility which is a big problem, right? So that makes it hard to think about getting a dedicated main into Cleveland. But we need to have that level of discussion now if we're going to preserve opportunities like this across the country and not make these kinds of, mis let these kinds of mistakes happen. And you need this context of they're talking about just from Chicago alone, potentially having um, 25 trains a day just going to Chicago, let alone going east to Pittsburgh, et cetera. You can't do that where Amtrak is today because this is a major freight corridor for CSX and Norfolk Southern. So we, this, having this study allows us to start thinking about these bigger term, longer term things. Now in the shorter term, probably this is the best place to have Amtrak service for its expansions, but maybe not because again, it's on Norfolk Southern's main line um, and you've got a movable bridge over the Cuyahoga, Cuyahoga River here. I don't have the answers. I don't pretend to have the answers, but this study gives the opportunity for local municipalities to start having these discussions in a very meaningful way. And Cleveland needs to have that discussion right now because there's a proposal to build a series of high skyscrapers here. Um, and maybe 
the city needs to think about that differently based on this idea of there might be 25 trains a day to Chicago, there might be 25 trains a day to Cincinnati, Detroit, et cetera. Um, so this study allows us to start having those discussions in a much more meaningful way. Moving into Chicago, um, you, you know, in the study, they identified that really the key to making this work is, is Chicago, you, that most of the trips want to come here. Now, if you make Chicago work, then other city pairs work, but Chicago's the center. We've got to figure out how to build a coalition uh, in these states here that we've highlighted in order to start really focusing on spending big dollars to get to O'Hare, to Chicago, and to McCormick Place. And we've started thinking about that. Again, I don't want to pretend we have the answer. We just want to get the discussion started about how you're making it work. And we've called that Crossrail Chicago. And part of doing this is, so this study looked at what I would call long distance trips, anything that's outside an urban area. Uh, so from the Chicago perspective, that's visitors, right? It didn't think about how you make this infrastructure useful for short distance trips between, um, between areas within a single urban market. We can combine those two together um, and then really the place for connecting these states to the world really is O'Hare. Um, and there are international flights out of uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Detroit, Cincinnati, St. Louis, um, but um, the biggest concentration of international flights is at O'Hare, at Atlanta, San Francisco, JFK, and LA. Right, so we need to figure out how to combine all of these types of trips together in order to make this infrastructure work. Um, a great example of how to do this is Caltrain linking San Francisco and San Jose, which is already under construction and you'll be able to ride essentially a high speed commuter train um, in the next couple of years, couple of three years. Um, and what they did was they took an old style diesel commuter train line. They're upgrading it to regional, regional now in the case of the infrastructure discussion I had at the beginning. So electrified trains um, with the stops between San Jose, very frequent stops, but they're also designing it so the high-speed trains can use that infrastructure when the high-speed, actual high-speed line gets built between San Jose and Burbank, and there will be a, a, a similar upgrade done between Burbank, LA, and Anaheim. So this is the example of how we make this work um, in, the, in the Midwest. Um, and I also want to point out for discussion later, Denver um, has a lot to, to uh, show us about how to make this work in this region. Uh, but again, they funded this with a mix of high speed commuter and commuter rail funds, transit funds and other funds. And you couldn't make the project work with commuter and transit funds alone or with high speed funds alone, but mixing them together makes it work. But again, you have to have a big picture plan and a long term vision in order to understand how to make these pieces to work. And this plan that the FRA has put together is the first stage in thinking about this. So uh, we need to be thinking about our existing assets and start where the existing assets are. In green, you've got the uh, lines where Metro is operating today where there's very little freight service. Um, so those are assets. We need to start thinking about how we use these. Um, I wanna point out that Amtrak today runs along this line, which the CP has a lot of freight on it from this point north. Um, one possibility is to persuade the CP uh, to work jointly with the North, uh, with the Union Pacific to move their freight onto a different line. That's one option. Um, we've also got this ability to, to quickly ramp up service along the existing UP North line um, in order to provide a lot more frequent service to Milwaukee. Again, I don't have the answer. 
but we need to really get the states thinking about what the actual plan is to make this work. We've also got two things coming down to University Park, Metro Electric, which for me, a key part of it is a four track electrified main line. Other parts could go to two tracks very easily. Um, and then alongside it, you've got the CN, which has very little freight train traffic on it. Unfortunately, only to this point here, approximately. Um, but so you've got this asset of, and then you've got the Rock Island coming to Joliet. So we've got these assets we can build upon. Um, the other quick, the, but then we've got these three points that we need to get to, O'Hare, downtown and McCormick Place. So we need to figure out how to make that happen and fit into this scheme of the assets we already have. And again, that's what we call, call Crossrail Chicago. So being this core piece in the middle that makes everything else work. Um, there's a big question to be asked about, answered about O'Hare. Unfortunately, the city has not thought about how to get trains to O'Hare. So they haven't really done a lot of work on that. Um, we know that uh, there's a big parking garage that's connected by people mover um, next to a metro station. So kind of the easiest option is to build a new station next to that parking garage add some track capacity in cooperation with the CN to CN's benefit um, in order to provide the access. And that could be the point of access for trains from around the region. Um, and that's also makes sense for a collector point for people who are driving from the suburbs, they could park their car and they're just in, like they were taking a plane, use that parking garage to get a train to Bloomington or, or wherever else. Um, so that's one option. Um, that probably makes sense as a, an initial for getting Amtrak service in there, et cetera. Uh, the problem is for regional trains or, or it within our urban area trains, you really need to be at Terminal 2 and Terminal 5. It's doable in terms of the way we think in rail projects. It's an expensive to get in there. In terms of the way they think in the aviation world, it's not that much. Um, it's doable. I don't know whether that's the way to do it or not, but, but that's one option. And then what we really should be talking about is a new tunnel that goes under the field um, and provides that part of that two and a half hour trip from St. Paul to downtown Chicago, where you're actually going underneath the terminals. Unfortunately, none of this planning has really happened yet. And again, this is part of what we need to do. We need to take all of these states in this region and start saying, let's get this planning underway as fast as possible. Um, another key project is what the A2 project, Metra's actually got this as one of their top priorities. They're also doing some initial work on how to get out to O'Hare. They've talked about that a couple of times publicly. This is exciting, but it's gonna be expensive. And again, this is going to have benefits to the entire country, not just Chicago, right? So we need to be thinking about this bigger. Um, and then Union Station again, um, it's really an embarrassment to the city. Um, this needs to be a top priority on, on um, getting it to be much more attractive for passengers, a lot more interesting place for passengers to go first. And second, the city, Metro and Amtrak have worked together to figure out how to add about 50% or more capacity to it um, in the existing footprint. Um, so again, multiple ways to do this. This should be a top priority with the Amtrak funds that Amtrak was given uh, to actually start working on making this happen. Uh, but this is the center of the network for the entire country. And then getting from, so we've got this prime right of way over here for coming in and out of the city um, and getting to Union Station, which is up here, this is gonna be a tough nut to crack. Uh, we really need to come down 
uh, needs to be a ramp coming up to a, either this existing bridge or a new bridge coming across here. Ideally, these tracks would fly over the tracks coming out of LaSalle Street Station. And then you got to duck under the, uh, the CTA tracks and then come in and figure out what to do about a station at, at McCormick Place. This is going to be hard to figure out. And Illinois is going to have to take the lead on this, I think. But it's going to take a multi-step effort, state effort, a multi-state effort in order to figure out how to make it work. Um, but with this context of the Midwest plan where you're talking about, you really need to figure out how to get a lot more trains in here. Again, that's the jumping off point for having this discussion. I also want to point out for future discussion amongst us, um, this is a major development here called the 78. And I hope you can see the, the uh, uh, this is already, um, uh, approved by the city, but it has some implications for how we're going to get through there. And then over here, above this rail yard here, um, there's a developer seeking to develop the air rights. Um, and this, again, is a critical project that could get in the way of doing high-speed rail in the future. So stakeholders from all around this the Midwest really have to be engaged in the city's process of designing what the air rights project will look like here. And the, this FRA plan sets the stage for having that conversation. But we need to get people from all around the Midwest much more engaged in that to talk about how we preserve the ability to run high-speed tracks through this or perhaps even have a high-speed train station in it. I don't begin to have the answer of how that works, but we have to have that conversation now. Um, we've done some thinking just to try to illustrate what the issues are around those two developments. Um, again, just ideas. We don't have the answer, but the states are really gonna have to really dig in um, and hopefully part of this infrastructure money will go towards actually answering this question. And then the other big nut to crack is how you get around the lake. So if you think about all of the routes coming in from um, uh, Grand Rapids, Lansing, Detroit, Toledo, Cleveland, Columbus, Pittsburgh, perhaps Indianapolis, South Bend, you've got a lot of trains that have to make it around here and it really is going to take finding right of way for two dedicated tracks preferably with zero grade crossings you've got so many trains coming through here they really have to get across here fast and reliable um, some initial study work has been done on this we need to ramp it up again and here comes into the governance question. All of this, most of this work is in Indiana, but most of the benefits occur to states outside Indiana. So how do you do that? And uh, we don't have the answer yet, but the plan that the FRA has released talks about the governance and they've started the conversation about how you deal with the governance of doing things like this. So um, in short, again, um, you know, this is really exciting. I want to add, uh, this is my interpretation of the FRA network. Uh, uh, it's slightly different than what they had at the beginning. I want to point that out. But I want to focus on the frequencies. And 24 trains a day on a route means you're really getting to something very, very exciting. And those trip times are based on the SNCF study. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, not what the FRA said. So um, that's a quick overview, or not so quick. I'm sorry, I went way over the proposed, the standard time. I hope uh, 
I hope I didn't get too boring there, but if uh, we'll take uh, any questions now, Chris, are there, there questions we need to answer? Yes, there are. Um, and thank you, Rick, and thank you, everyone, um, for your comments and questions. Um, uh, the first one is um, uh, from Greeny Van Buren. What is the timeline for all the plans? Um, so unfortunately, that's part of the detailed planning. Um, that's step number one is you actually have to do the detailed plan line, planning to figure out the timeline. The other is we just got a big chunk of money in the infrastructure bill. Um, we've had a catch-22 in, in high-speed rail development in that People don't want to do the detailed plans unless they know the money's coming and you can't get the money to come without the detailed plans. So one of the things we have to do is make sure that municipalities across the region are asking Congress to fund these, these programs every year. So again, for next year, 2023, we need to have Congress appropriate more money so that you can actually start to work on timelines because you've got steady funding coming in. Great, and um, you know, speaking of um, you know that kind of need for ongoing support, um, uh, this next question comes from Tom Galloway, um, uh, who said, "This is all well and good, but how do we motivate the various state and federal legislators to get on board with this?" Um, so the way we do that is we keep people at the um, civic level highly engaged, continue to keep them motivated, have them have high expectations and work with their state legislators and governors to, to do two things at once. One, do the big picture planning, but two, just as importantly, get some immediate wins. So how can Michigan add frequencies today? There are some ways they can do it. Um, let's work on that while they work on the big picture plans. Let's get the new station track built at Kalamazoo while Michigan continues to work on the plans. But this all comes together down to keeping municipal level leaders engaged, motivated, and connected to each other. And uh, you know, maybe on a on a related note, uh, Bill Porter asks: uh, Is the Midwest Rail Compact the group to engage to jumpstart the planning process? So uh, the Midwest Interstate, yes. The short answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of names for a lot of, a lot of groups <laughs> and studies. <laughs> Absolutely, the Midwest Interstate Passenger Rail Commission. Uh, plays a critical role in doing this coordination. Um, and we're also very happy that in the infrastructure bill, um, there are funds to specifically fund their work. Great. And um, Rick, you, uh, you spoke a bit about using lines with little to no freight already, uh, but Mark Hoover asked, uh, can we think about moving the freight lines to reserve existing uh, corridors for passenger rail? Um, so again, um, that goes back to one of my core philosophies, which is you have to start with the owner of the land is the owner of the land and they have to see this as a good business proposition. And maybe in some cases, um, it's good business for them to um, give up specific rights of way and use other rights of way or maybe the answer is to purchase a specific right of way that they're already not using very well. Or maybe the answer is to build a new tracks alongside an interstate highway. But again, you have to have the detailed planning to understand what works in each case. Okay. And uh, uh, here's another freight related question um, with an example from the UK. Um, uh, I don't know, Rick, are you familiar with the Orion service in the UK from London to Glasgow? You know, uh, no. Oh, okay. Um, the, the question um, was if, uh, if that could serve as a model for a possible Amtrak return to parcel package freight service and corridors. 
Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, so um, we have talked as um, rail advocates since the first day that I um, started this or got involved in this. I didn't start this, obviously. This is a, a multi-generational effort. Um, but when I got involved in this, ever since, it seems to make sense that parcels and passenger trains go together. But there isn't a broad consensus on how they go together. Um, and it's an area of study, frequently, uh, frankly, that we would like to do a lot more research into. And so if there's somebody that has a foundation uh, that would be interested in funding the answer to that question, well, we want to talk to them and please connect us. But it seems like there should be synergies there. Right. And, uh, and speaking of, uh, you know, talking to us or contacting us, um, I wanted to point out that someone had asked uh, for our email addresses. And so I put them in the, in the Q&A. And... Um, uh, can share those again if, if needed. Um, there was uh, during uh, during uh, your presentation, Rick. There was some lively discussion in the chat about um, plans by the Missouri DOT to cut funding for service between St. Louis and Kansas City. And uh, the um, uh, you know one of the sort of main questions that coming out of that uh, little discussion was you know will that hurt the the regional plan uh, that the or you know this this vision that the the FRA has laid out. So what needs to happen is um, uh, our members in Missouri need to really get riled up in a big way and say that's completely unacceptable. And not only that, only two trains a day is unacceptable. So it's time to start really expanding that program now. Um, and uh, that again is about connecting the leaders of all the cities who are served by that and the cities that should be on the expansion of that to like Springfield, for example. Um, so uh, again, what we need to just put a line in the sand, it's not acceptable to cut that and it really needs to get to four or five trains a day as soon as possible. Okay, uh, here's another question uh, that relates to St. Louis. Um, is the High Speed Rail Alliance uh, encouraging maintaining the existing Chicago to St. Louis alignment? Uh, rather than the Chicago Champaign St. Louis alignment. So, um, so we need to add frequencies on the existing Amtrak route. And again, this is a complex multi step answer um, in order to be very clear. There need to be more frequencies on the existing routes. Um, um, and especially on the Chicago to St. Louis route. There should be at least eight trains a day there in order to make that work right. Um, we did propose building um, the new high-speed line via Champaign and Decatur uh, for several reasons. One being what we thought was a good right-of-way answer um, the other was not duplicating what already was being done between Chicago and Bloomington. Uh, a third was to add Decatur into the network. We had multiple reasons for doing that. I still think it's a good idea, but I want to be very clear. It's up to the state to come to the final conclusion, and the state hasn't done any true design work on that yet. So what we really need to do is have IDOT start to answer these questions. And the first stage of that will be the um, uh, Illinois High Speed Rail Commission, which um, is, uh, was formed. And I wanna thank um, Representative Moylan and uh, Senator Sandoval and the governor for supporting that. Um, but that's the forum we have for having this discussion of how that actually happens. Great. Yeah, we had a lot of uh, discussion in the in the chat, and uh, I, I think that I got all the questions out of it. 
Uh, we do have a few more minutes left, though. So if anyone does have any questions, you know, please, you know, we've still got a, a couple minutes. Um, here's one more that, that I was wondering about. Um, you know, Rick, you, you showed uh, for the Midwest uh, in particular, you know, you showed uh, graphics and maps from previous studies that had been done uh, as far back as, as the 90s. Um, but have you ever seen anything like this before that reaches for a national network by building up in regions? Uh, like the Midwest, Southwest, and Southeast, uh, you know, and that, that map of the whole country that you showed. Um, how does this compare to previous efforts uh, to work out what needs to happen nationwide? Um, I think this is a huge step in the right direction because um, uh, unfortunately, high-speed rail advocates weren't confident enough, you know, and, and we've talked for generations about 100 to 300 mile trips, the people who get more confident talk about 500 mile trips, right? We really should have talk, been talking about a national network that combines both high speed and regional and shared use lines. Um, so the fact that with these studies, they've basically proposed corridors that go from New Orleans to Boston, if you put all the connections together, and from Minneapolis to Miami, with that connection at Nashville, we're heading in that direction, but we need to be much more aggressive about it as a country. Okay. And uh, here's a, a question that's just come in um, from Marcus Webster. Does reducing, federal subsidi or does reducing federal subsidized air travel to rural airports factor into expanding the rail network to these airports such as the quad cities um you know the the air market is so small in all cases that you know it, it's it's really about creating much more connectivity between much more many more places um so um whether or not uh, a place like moline would still highly value it's a couple three planes a day to o'hare is not relevant to the fact of whether or not you need rail service to Malay. Okay. And uh, it's just about one o'clock, so um, this might be our last question. Um, but uh, Jordan asks, uh, is there any discussion in the Midwest about maglev rail? Um, I'm sorry, I just noticed a chat that's very important and I, I felt I was making a mistake and what was corrected. Uh, Senator Stadelman, was the champion for the Illinois High Speed Rail Commission in Illinois um, from Rockford. And so thank you very much, Senator Stadelman, for your support. We really appreciate that. Um, and uh, getting back to Maglev, um, um, uh, no, there hasn't been any discussion about Maglev in, in the Midwest. Well, uh, I believe we've uh, addressed all the questions. It's one o'clock. Um, we at, at the height, we had more than 100 people uh, attending here today. So thank you all. Uh, and, and thank you, Rick, for your presentation. Yes, thank you all. Oh, I want to point out, I've been drinking out of the high speed rail mug, right? I think this is the old one, Midwest high speed rail, but we have new ones. Um, if you liked this program today, please go to um, high speed rail dot us slash join and make a donation uh, so that we can continue to keep people educated, motivated and uh, engaged. Thank you.